the scarecrow and his servant day five. When it was summertime, he and the other servants had to wait on the officers in their tent. Captain Scarecrow was behaving with great politeness, engaging his neighbors in lively and stimulating conversation and sipping his wine like a connoisseur. The only thing that went wrong was when the officers took snuff at their meal. The proper way to take it was to put a little pinch on the back of your hand, sniff it briskly up your nose, and try not to sneeze. But the Scarecrow had never come across snuff before, and he sniffed up too much. Jack could see what was going to happen, and he ran up with the tea towel, but it was too late. With a gigantic explosion, the scarecrow sneezed so hard that all the buttons popped off his uniform. His umbrella opened in surprise, and bits of straw flew everywhere. Not only that, his turnip itself came loose and lolled on his neck like a balloon on a stick. If Jack hadn't been there to hold it, to hold it, it might have come off altogether and rolled right across the table. As soon as the scarecrow recovered his wits, he looked at Jack in horror. Dear me, what a ghastly experience, he said. Was that the Duke of Brunswick attacking us? There was a terrible explosion, I'm sure of it. Just a touch of gunpowder in the snuff, said Colonel Bombardo. Better than snuff better than snuff in the gunpowder. What? Cannons be sneezing, not firing. Dang, poor show. Presently, the sergeant came in and said it was time for all the officers to go to bed. Jack helped Scarecrow to their tent. It'll be an exciting day tomorrow, Jack, said the Scarecrow. Jack tucked him up in the camp bed. I'm sure it will, Master. I better sew all those buttons on extra tight in case you sniff some gum gunpowder. Good night. Good night, Jack. What a good servant you are. So they all went to sleep. When they woke up, there was no sign of the Sardinians, but the Duke of Brunswick army had turned up during the night and made camp in the meadow across the river. There was lots of them. He's got a big army, said Jack to the cook as they made breakfast. It's all show, said the cook. Them big cannons they've got, they're only made of cardboard. Anyway, the Sardinians will be here soon. But the Sardinians didn't show up at all. While well, the Duke of Brunswick soldiers lined up their cannons pointed straight across the river, the officers of the Scarecrow's regiment rode up and down, waving their swords and shouting orders. Meanwhile, the sergeant was drilling the troops. He marched them along the, the marched them along the river bank and then made them about turn and march back the other way. Not many of them fell in. And while they were doing that, the gunners got their cannons all lined up, <clears throat> one behind the other, to go across the famous secret bridge that the Sardinians were going to bring. The Duke of Brunswick's, Brunswick's soldiers kept looking at them and pointing and laughing. They won't be laughing when the Sardinians come, said the chief gunner, but there was no sign of the Sardinians. Finally, at about tea time, a messenger came galloping up with some shocking news. Jack was close by, and he heard the sergeant telling Colonel Bombardo all about it. Message here from the King of Sardinia, sir, he said. He's changed his mind, and he's joining forces with the Duke of Brunswick. I say, what do you think we should do, sergeant? Run away, sir. Just what he'll be expecting. Very bad idea, if you ask me. We'll do just the opposite. We'll go across the forward, and before the Duke of Brunswick knows what's hit him, we'll give him a th sound thrashing. Very good, sir. This forward, sir? Yes. Where is it, sir? In the river, sergeant. Right there. Right you are, sir. You're going first, are you, sir, to lead the way? You think I should? It's the usual thing, sir. Then charge. And Colonel Bombardo galloped his horse right off the bank and into the water and disappeared at once. No one else moved. No one except Jack, that is. He saw the scarecrow looking in an interested way at the river, where Colonel Bombardo Shako had just floated to the surface, and he ran through all the ranks of soldiers and passed the guns and seized hold of Betsy's bridle. It was a good thing he did, because at that very moment there came a terrific volley of firing from the Duke of Brunswick's army across the river, and almost at once there came another volley from the other direction, altogether from behind them. It's the Sardinians, someone said. And then there were cannons going off all over the place. The regiment was trapped on the riverbank with the Sardinians behind them and the Duke of Brunswick's army on the other side, and there was no ford at all. The air was full of gunpowder smoke, and no one could see anything. Soldiers were shouting and crying and running in all directions. Bullets were whizzing through the air from every side. Cannonballs were smashing into the tents and the wagons, and the scarecrow was waving his sword and shouting, Charge! Luckily, no one took any notice. Then a stray cannonball whizzed past Betsy's flanks, giving her a nasty fright and taking some of the Scarecrow's trousers with it. Whoa, help, cried the Scarecrow. It's all right, Master, just hold on, said Jack. And then a bullet clipped the Scarecrow's head, sending bits of turnip everywhere. Charge, shouted the Scarecrow again, waving his sword so wildly that Jack was worried in case he cut Betsy's head off by mistake. But then another bullet came, across, came along and knocked the sword out of his hand with a loud clang. Now look what you've done, cried the Scarecrow. He scrambled down from Betsy's back and was about to run straight at the nearest soldiers and join in the fight when Jack saw him suddenly stop and peer into a bush. What is it, Master? He said. Look, you can't hang around here. It's dangerous. But the Scarecrow took no notice. He was reaching right in among the leaves, and then he carefully lifted out a nest. Sitting in the nest was a terrified robin. This is quite intolerable, the Scarecrow was saying to her. 
Madam, I offer my apologies on behalf of the regiment. It is no part of a soldier's duty to terrify a mother and her eggs. He owes a duty of care and protection to the weak and defenseless. Sit tight, madam, and I shall remove you at once to a place of safety. Tucking the nest into his jacket, the scarecrow set off. There was a short pause when a stray bullet shot his leg off, and he had to lean on Jack's arm. But slowly they made their way through the battlefield. Around them, soldiers in red uniforms were fighting with soldiers with blue uniforms, waving swords, firing pistols, and muskets. And then along came some soldiers in green uniforms as well. The thunder of explosions and the groans and screams and the crack of muskets and the whine of bullets and the crackle of flames were appalling. And the things Jack saw going on were so horrible that he just closed his eyes and kept stumbling forward, leading Betsy with one hand and holding the scarecrow up with the other, until the worst of the noise had faded behind him, behind them. There was a bush close by, and before he did anything else, the scarecrow lifted the nest out of his jacket, with the robin still sitting on it, and placed it gently in among the leaves. There you are, madame, he said politely, with the compliments of the regiment. Then he fell over. Jack helped him up again, stuffing back the straw that was coming out all over the place. What a battle, said the scarecrow. Bang, crash, whizzed. Look at the state of you, said Jack. You're full of bullet holes, and you've only got one leg, and part of your turnip's gone. I'm going to have to tidy you up. You're badly wounded. I shouldn't think anyone's more wounded than I am, said the scarecrow proudly. Not unless they're dead. Sit still. Jack took a good strong stick from the bundle of spare parts he tied onto Betsy's saddle before the battle began. He slid it inside the remains of the scarecrow's trouser leg. The scarecrow sprang up at once. Back to the battle, he said. I want to win a medal, Jack. That's my dearest wish. I wouldn't mind losing all my legs and my arms and my head and everything. If only I could have a medal. Jack was busy tying the rest of the sticks together to make a raft. Well, master, he said, if you turned up at that farm with no legs and no arms and no head and no sense, but with a medal shining on your chest, I don't suppose the broom would be able to resist. Don't remind me, Jack, my broken heart. In the excitement of battle, I had almost forgotten. Oh, oh, I loved her so much. While the scarecrow was lamenting, Jack gave Betsy a carrot. Go on, old girl. You can look after yourself, he said, and Betsy ambled away and disappeared in the bushes. Now, master, you come with me, Jack went on, finishing the raft. Because we've got a secret mission. It's very important, so just keep quiet. All right? Shh, said the scarecrow. Not a word. And Jack pushed the raft out onto the water. And he and the scarecrow scrambled on board. And a few minutes later, they were floating down the river with the sound of battle and cr the cries of the wounded soldiers fading quickly behind them. Chapter 10, Shipwreck. While the scarecrow and his servant were floating down the river, two important conversations were taking place. The first one happened on the riverbank where Mr. Circarelli was talking to the sergeant of the scarecrow's regiment and amid the wreckage of the battlefield. The last I seen of him, sir, he was charging into battle like a gun, the soldier told him. He made a fine figure of an officer. An officer, you say? Captain Scarecrow was one of the most gallant officers I ever saw. Fearless, you might say. Or else you might say, thick as a brick. But he did, did his duty by the regiment. Did he survive the battle? I couldn't tell you that, sir. I haven't seen him since. Mr. Circarelli looked at the devastation all around them. By the way, he said, who won? The Duke of Brunswick, sir, according to the morning paper. Very hard to tell from here. It was the King of Sardinia changing sides at the last minute that did us in. The lawyer made a mental note to congratulate his employers. The Buffalo Corpor Corporation had important financial interests in Sardinia. No doubt they had reminded the king about them. Mind you, the sergeant went on, we got a return battle next month. Oh, really? Yes, sir, and it'll go different next time because the King of Naples is coming in with us. The lawyer made a mental note to take his, make, t tell his employers that as well. If you hear any more of Captain Scarecrow, he said, here's my card. Good day. The other conversation took place through a window in a little farmhouse. Hey, you, called Granny Raven, perching. Perching among the geraniums in the window box. An old man and his wife were sitting at the table, wrapping their crockery in newspaper and putting it in a cardboard box. They both looked up in astonishment. Here, said the old man to his wife, that's old Carlo's pet, the one, the one that, the one that escaped. Granny Raven clapped her beak impatiently. Yes, that's me, she said. Even if you've got it the wrong way, he was my pet, and I didn't escape. I flew off to find a doctor. Only I was too late. Now stop gaping like a pair of fly traps and pay attention. But you're talking, said the old woman. Yes, this is, a, is an emergency. Oh, said the old man, gulping. Go on, then. Not long before old Carlo died, Granny Raven said, he asked you both to go over and do something for him. Do you remember what that was? Well, yes, said the old woman. He asked us to sign a piece of paper. And did you? Yes, said the old man. Right, said Granny Raven. Then she clapped her beak again and looked at the table. What are you doing with that crockery, she said. Packing, said the old woman. Ever since the buffalo factor, factor, buffalo buffalo factor, 
factory opened. Our springs dried up. We can't live here anymore. They're taking care, taking everything over them, Buffaloinis. It's not like what it used to be. Poor old Carlo's well out of it, I reckon. Well, do you want to fight the Buffaloinis? Buffalonis? Or give in? Give in, said the old man. And fight them, said the old woman, both at once. Two to one, said Granny Raven, looking at the old man very severely. We win. Now listen to me and do as I say. When Jack woke up, the raft was floating along swiftly together with lots of broken branches and shattered hen coops and one or two dead dogs and other bits and pieces. The water was muddy and turbid, and the sun was beating down from a hot sky, and the scarecrow was sitting placidly watching the distant banks go by. Master, why didn't you wake me before we drifted this far down river? Oh, we're making wonderful progress, Jack. You never believe how far we've come. I don't think it's taking this spring valley, though, said Jack, standing up and shading his eyes to look ahead. Very soon he couldn't see, even see the banks anymore, and the water, when he dipped his hand in, turned out to be too salty to drink. Master, he said, we're drifting out to sea. I think we've left the land altogether. The scarecrow was astonished. Just like that, he said. We don't have to pay a toll or anything? How clever. I never thought I'd go to sea. This will be very interesting. Why, yes, it will, master, said Jack. We don't know whether we'll drown before we starve to death, or starve to death before we drown, or die of thirst, maybe. It'll be interesting to find out. We'd better... We'd be better off getting shot to pieces by cannonballs, if you ask me. Now then, you're forgetting the man in the misty cart, Jack. Fame and glory, remember? I think we've had that already, Master. We're on to the danger and suffering now. But it ends in triumph and happiness. Jack was too fed up to say anything. He sat on the edge of the raft and stared glumly all around. There was not a speck of land anywhere, and the sun glared like a furnace in the burning sky. The scarecrow saw his unhappiness and said, Cheer up, Jack. I'm sure that success is just around the corner. We're at sea, Master. There aren't any corners. Hmm, said the Scarecrow. I think I'll scan the horizon. So Jack held on to his Master's legs, and the Scarecrow held on to Jack's head, and peered this way and that, shading his eyes with the umbrella. But there was nothing to be seen except more and more water. Very dull, said the Scarecrow, a little disappointed. There isn't even a seagull to scare. I don't like the looks of those clouds, though, said Jack, pointing at the horizon. I think we're going to have a storm. Well, this is just what we need, I must say. The clouds got higher and bigger and darker as they watched, and presently a stiff wind began to blow and make, making the water lurch up and down in a very unpleasant way. A storm at sea, Jack, said the Scarecrow eagerly. This will be a noble spectacle. All the awe-inspiring powers of nature will be unleashed over our heads. There, you see? There was a flash of lightning, and only a few seconds later the loudest crash of thunder Jack had ever heard. And then came the rain. The heavy drops hurled down as fast as bullets and almost as hard. Never mind, my boy, shouted the scarecrow over the noise. Here, shelter under my umbrella. No, master, put it down. Whatever you do will be struck by lightning, and that'll be the end for both of us. The two of them clung together on their fragile raft, with the waves getting higher and rougher, and the sky getting darker, and the thunder getting closer, and the wind getting fiercer every minute. And then Jack felt the sticks of the raft beginning to come loose. Master, hold on. Don't let go. Whatever you do, he cried. This is exciting, Jack. Boom, crash, whoosh, splash. Then the biggest wave of all swept over them, and the raft collapsed completely. Oh no, it's coming apart! Help, help! Jack and the Scarecrow clung together as they fell into the water among the loose sticks and the bits of string that were all that was left of the raft. Master, help! I can't swim! Don't worry, my boy, I can float! Hold on to me! I shan't let you down! Jack didn't dare open his mouth again in case he swallowed more sea. In mortal terror, he clung to his master as the waves hurled them this way and that. How long they floated, he had no idea, but eventually the storm passed over, the waves calmed down, the clouds rolled away, and the sun came out. Jack was trembling with the effort of holding tight and weak from hunger and thirst, and still very frightened, so when the scarecrow said something, he had to reply. What's that, master? I didn't hear you. I said I can see a tree, Jack. What? Where? The scarecrow twisted around a bit in the water and stood up. Jack was too, too amazed to do more than lie there and look up at his master as his master stood above him, shaking the water out of his clothes and pointing ahead. Then Jack realized that he wasn't floating anymore. In fact, he was lying in a very shallow water at the edge of a beach. We're safe, he cried. We haven't drowned. We're still alive. He jumped to his feet and skipped ashore, full of joy. It didn't matter that he was cold and wet and hungry. Nothing like that mattered a bit. He was alive. The scarecrow was ahead of him, peering about with great interest. The tree he had seen was a palm tree with one solitary coconut hanging high up among the leaves, and as Jack found when he joined his master, it was the only tree to be seen. We're on a tropical island, he said. We're shipwrecked. 
Well, Jack, said the Scarecrow, I wonder what we'll find on this island. Quite often people find buried chests full of treasure, you know. I think we should start digging right away. We'd better be... We'd be better off looking for food, Master. You can't eat Dublins and pieces of eight. The Scarecrow looked all around. It was a very small island indeed. They could see all the way across it, and Jack reckoned that even if he walked slowly, it would take him, take him only take him ten minutes to walk around, all the way around the edge. Never despair, said the Scarecrow. I shall think of something. Jack thought we, he'd better look for some water before he died of thirst, so he wandered into the middle of the island among the bushes to look for something to drink. But, but there was no stream, no pond, nothing. He found some little fruits and ate one just to see if it was juicy, but it was so sour and bitter that he had to spit it out at once, although he thought it was a waste of spit because he didn't have any to spare. He looked at every different kind of leaf in the case there was a cup-shaped one that had kept a drop of dew from the night before, but all the leaves were either flat and floppy or dry and hairy or thin and spiny, and none of them held a single drop of water. Oh dear, he said to himself, we're in big trouble, trouble now. This is the biggest trouble we've seen yet. This is a desperate situation, and no mistake. With a slow and happy tread, Jack continued his short walk around the island. Less than five minutes later, he came back to the coconut palm. He tried to climb the, the trunk, but there were no branches to hold on to. He tried to throw stones at the coconut, but it was too high. He tried to shake the trunk, but it didn't move. He moved in the shade and lay down, feeling so hungry and miserable and frightened that he began to cry. He found himself sobbing and weeping and couldn't stop, and he realized that, although he was partly crying for himself, he was partly crying for the poor scarecrow, too, because his master wouldn't understand at all when he found his servant lying there dead and turning into a skeleton. He wouldn't know what to do. He'd be so distressed and with no, no one to look after him. He'd just wander about the island forever until he fell apart. Oh, Jack, Jack, my dear boy, he heard, and he fell, felt a pair of rough wooden arms embracing him. Don't distress yourself. Life and hope, you know. Life and hope. I'm sorry, Master, Jack said. I'll stop now. Did you have an interesting walk? Oh, yes, I found a bush that looks just like a turkey and another bush with little flowers the same color as a starling's egg and a stone exactly as big as a duck. It's full of interesting things, you know, this island. Oh, and I found a little place that looks just like Spring Valley in miniature. Spring Valley, Master? I'd like to have a look at that. Then follow me. Scarecrow led him to a spot near the middle of the island where the ground rose up a little way, and where some bare rocks stood above the surface, in between them there was a little grassy hollow. You see, said the Scarecrow, the farmhouse is here, and there's the orchard, and that's where the vines grow, and the olives are over there, and the stream runs down here. Nice looking place, Master. I wish there was a real stream here, though. Then we shall just have to dig a well, Jack. There's bound to be some fresh water under here. That's what we do in Spring Valley. Well, said Jack. Yes, a well. You dig there. And I'll dig here, said the scarecrow, and he began to scrape vigorously at the ground with a dry stick. There was nothing be better to do, so Jack found a stick, too, and scraped and poked and scrabbled at the earth. The sun was hot, and the work made him even thirstier than he was to begin with, and besides, the end of the stick soon got wedged under a corner of a big rock. He found a stone to jam under the stick so he could lever the rock out. The scarecrow was happily scratching away farther down the miniature spring valley, singing to himself, and Jack heaved down on his stick with all his might. The big rock shifted a bit, he heaved again, and it shifted some more. It looked a bit funny for a rock. The corner was perfectly square, for one thing, <clears throat> and for another, it wasn't made of rock at all. It was made of wood and bound with iron. Jack felt his eyes grow wider and wider. The iron was, was rusty, and the wood was decaying, and there was a great big padlock holding it shut, which fell off as soon as he touched it. Then he lifted the lid. Master, he cried, treasure, look, you were right. The box was packed with coins, jewels, medals, necklaces, bracelets, pendants, rings for ears, rings and rings for fingers, medallions, and every kind of gold ornament. They spilled out of the top of the box and jingled heavily as they fell on the ground. The scarecrow's muddy little eyes couldn't open wide at the best of times, but they were fairly goggling. Well, that's amazing, Jack, he said. The scarecrow picked up an earring and felt around the side of his turnip for an ear. But there wasn't one. Then he picked up a necklace and tried to put it on, but it wouldn't go over his turn up at all. So he put a gold bracelet, golden bracelet on his side post wrist, and it fell straight off. Jack plunged his hands into the chest and filled them with coins and jewels, holding them high and letting them fall down through his fingers. We must be millionaires, Master, he said, but his mouth was so dry that he couldn't speak properly. All the same, he croaked, I'd rather have some water. Would you, my boy? There would be... There should be enough in the well by now. Come and see. Jack thought he was hallucinating. He scrambled to his feet and ran after the scarecrow. And sure enough, in the spot where he'd been digging, a little stream had started bubbling. Oh, master. Oh, thank you. Oh, oh, oh. Jack flung himself to the ground and plunged his face into the muddy water and drank and drank and drank until his belly could hold no more. The scarecrow was watching him with 
quiet satisfaction. There you are. You see, he said, we understand water in Spring Valley. Jack went back, bloated, and let, it, let the blessed, blessed feeling of not being thirsty anymore soak him from head to feet. When he got up, the spring was still bubbling away, and the water was trickling down toward the beach. It didn't look as though it would get there, because most of it sank straight into the dry earth. The scarecrow was busy somewhere else. Jack could hear him singing to himself. So, looking carefully at the way the earth sloped and where the rocks were, Jack found another stick and began to dig. What are you doing, Jack? called the scarecrow. I'm making a reservoir, Master. What are you doing? Sorting out the treasure, came the answer. Good idea. So Jack went on digging until there was a hole as deep as his arm and about the same size across. And he patted the earth smooth and tight all around inside it. Then he scraped a trench in the soil and led the water from the spring down into his new hole. The scarecrow came to watch. See, Master, once the water is in there, all the mud will sink to the bottom and will be nice and clear to drink from. Jack explained. Excellent, said the scarecrow. A splendid piece of civil engineering. Jack. Jack scraped another trench at the other side for the water to run away once the reservoir was full. They stood and watched the hole filling up. Now come and see what I've done, said the scarecrow proudly. He made a little grotto with some stones and some mud, and he'd stuck diamonds and pearls and rubies and emeralds all over it with some sticky gum from a bush. He'd made a pretty pattern in the ground with some gold coins and another pattern with silver ones. And then he'd made some pretend trees out of sticks and draped the necklaces over them like icicles. That's lovely, master, said Jack. And I haven't even begun to sort the coins out. Oh, there's endless food for the mind here, Jack. Food. Jack looked longingly at the coconut palm, but the coconut still hung there high up among the leaves, as if it were mocking him. He tried to put it out of his mind. At least he had something to drink. So while the scarecrow worked on his grotto, Jack went down to the beach and walked up and down looking for a fish to catch, but there wasn't a fish to be seen. He could feel himself going a little crazy from hunger. Maybe I could eat one of my toes, he said to himself. I wouldn't really miss it, not a little one. But there wouldn't be enough meat on just one. I'd need a whole foot, or two, maybe. He paddled up and down at the edge of the sea, sunk in misery. Then he went to the reservoir to have another drink, and the scarecrow showed him the grotto, with great pride, pointing out all the architectural and de decorative effects. There, Jack, what do you think of that? Do you see how, I, how I've arranged the stones with all the light ones here and all the dark ones there? I think I'll go and look for some shells now so to stick around the edge. But, Jack, what's the matter, my boy? I'm sorry, Master. I've tried not to give in to despair, but I'm starving to death. I think what you're making there must be my burial place, and a very nice one, too. But I don't want to starve to death. I don't want to do—I don't know what to do, Master. Really, I don't. 